Healthcare workers now make up one in 10 known COVID-19 cases in Ontario, and no one wants to see those numbers get any worse. With us now on how to keep doctors and nurses and orderlies and support staff, lab techs, and the many, many others safe, we welcome in Stainer, Ontario, Dr. Sohail Gandhi. He is president of the Ontario Medical Association. And in Toronto, from her home, Doris Grinspoon, CEO of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and from his office, Dr. Ross Upshur, who is the professor at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health, where he specializes in duty to care and medical ethics. Just the right group of people for this discussion today. Thank you all for joining us from your various locations around the province. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, I want to start with you first, and I want to know how concerned you are about the amount of PPE, personal protective equipment, that the province has today in order to combat the surge we are expecting to see over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so unfortunately the surge has actually started, Steve, and in light of that I'm actually quite concerned about the fact that we don't have a, a good line of sight on where the equipment is. Uh, I know that the province has ordered a, a large supply of equipment, I think that's wonderful. I know there's federal uh, government uh, endeavors as well to order some equipment and I think that's wonderful as well. Uh, but the reality is at this point in time uh, I don't know on behalf of my members, I don't know whether the equipment's in a warehouse, I don't know if it's in a truck, I don't know where it's going, I don't know what the framework is being used to distribute the equipment properly because of course we know the hospitals need some, but there are also various community centers, uh, family practice offices and outpatient clinics that need PPEs as well because a lot of the work that they do is to keep people out of hospital and prevent patients from going to hospital in this length of time. So it would be nice to have a line of sight that way. Hmm. Dr. Gandhi, I want to do one, a quick follow-up with you because I'm hearing anecdotal evidence and I suspect you have uh, a much uh, deeper sense of how things are. Do you know whether doctors are reusing gear that was meant to be used only once but that they are using for more than one patient at a time? Yeah, so I have not heard that doctors are actually doing that. I've seen recommendations come from various sources. Uh, those sources have not been approved, by the way, uh, suggesting that PPEs can be reused if you do things like bake a mask in an oven at 70 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes and use peroxide, and I've heard all of this, um, but I've not heard specific instances of when physicians have used reused PPEs yet. Is any of that true, what you just said? Well, that's just it. It hasn't been tested, right? Uh, before I go out and recommend something, I want to see the data to make sure that this is safe. I'm just talking about rumors that are out there right now. I don't know if this is 100% safe or not, and we need some guidance that way. Got it. Uh, Doris Grinspoon, let's get the view from uh, the nurses of this province. How is the lack of PPE changing the way they do their job? Hugely, hugely, and we have a sounding the alarm bell actually for over a month. Uh, Steve, we, we were concerned that the framework that this province uh, was using all along was low risk, low risk, and then we moved into best case scenario. This is never has been a best case scenario, and therefore we are ill prepared with PPE and ventilators and with anything else. Uh, we are very concerned because uh, to the point that Dr. Gandhi made, yes, there are attempts already. The hospital are collecting uh, the PPE after the shift in relationship to N95. There is research going on and, and uh, methods going on to see if any of them uh, will provide uh, safe results for uh, workers, not only nurses, but all of them. And uh, of course, that will be last case scenario, uh, but it's concerning. How is changing the lives of nurses and others? Uh, let me summarize in the statement that one of the pe persons that write of the hundreds of emails I get a day said to me, she said to me, before I was all focused with my intellect, <clears throat> with my heart, and with my all being to take care, taking care of patients, to uh, help them get well, to save lives, to uh, be with them in, in knowledge and compassion. Now, uh, that is all tempered by a PPE, and therefore they cannot uh, even use their, their way of practicing the way they need. So not only is affecting their safety and their, uh, their worries about themselves, but it's affecting the way they practice, and they're equally concerned about both aspects of it. If you look, this is in ICUs, if you look at 
nursing homes. The nursing homes are um, the worst chapter in the book that we would write yet. Um, and I say the collective book for all of us. Nursing homes, when you look at a PSWs, cannot even um, surgical masks. I'm talking about something as simple as these tips, surgical masks, and nurses and others that come face to face with patients and they are getting the supplies after an outbreak. So no wonder we are at about 120 nursing homes and retirement homes that are an outbreak. Nothing that any hmm. other province has this amount. And we have been asking and asking that the surgical mask to the nursing homes need to come ahead so that we can prevent outbreak. It's, it's, it's tired the situation and it makes us extremely worried both from a practice perspective and from the safety of health professionals perspective, all of them. Understood. Just before I get Dr. Upshur to respond, um, I do want to go back to Dr. Gandhi for a second just to find out whether or not, Dr. Gandhi, you are hearing from physicians right now that they feel so unsafe uh, that they don't want to show up for work. What are you hearing? Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of anxiety from our members for sure, Steve. Uh, you know, every physician wants to help the patients of Ontario. That's what we do. We want to help them and we want to protect them and we want to give them the best possible medical treatment that we can. But I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's an expectation that if we're going to do that, we need to be able to do that with the right equipment and PPEs are part of that equipment. And unfortunately right now we don't have that. And I know there's quite a bit of concern on part of our members as to how we're gonna keep our patients safe because a lot of physicians are concerned saying, well, if I go into this environment, I'm not protected, but then I'm needed in a different environment. If I go from the hospital to my office, that's what, you know, that's what we do in Stainer. Um, how do I know I'm not spreading this uh, virus to one of my other patients because I didn't have the right equipment when I needed it. Hmm. I want Dr. Upshur just to read something that was in the Canadian Medical Association Code of Ethics and written nearly a hundred years ago. And then we'll come out of a question after that. Uh, the um, statement in question goes like this. When pestilence prevails, it is their duty, the physician's duty, to face the danger and to continue their labors for the alleviation of suffering, even at the jeopardy of their own lives. Okay, that's from 1922. I want to get a sense from you about how different or not the guidance doctors get today is from that advice from nearly 100 years ago. Thanks, Steve. First, I'd like to uh, hope and wish that uh, uh, you and your family as well, and the same for Doris and Sohail, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. So, um, after SARS and in the uh, interim period when we were very concerned about an evolving uh, potential uh, influenza pandemic, I had the great fortune of chairing a World Health Organization working group on uh, duty to care and healthcare professionals. So it's important to contextualize our thinking about this, both historically and globally. Um, historically, up until the time of antisepsis, uh, physicians did not uh, actually have access to personal protective equipment. And until such time as Semmelweis established that uh, hand hygiene was important in reducing transmission of infection within hospitals, uh, physicians actually largely uh, practiced in situations where they succumbed uh, at fairly high rates historically through the plagues uh, of the past uh, to infections. And in fact, in Toronto, close to where I live in Kew Gardens, is a memorial to a physician. It's the Dr. William D. Young Memorial Fountain in Kew Beach Park. Uh, uh, he was a community physician who died in 1918 providing care uh, for his uh, patients in the East End of Toronto. Did so, he die from the Spanish flu? Yes, he did. Um, he did. In fact, a large proportion of, uh, there was an interesting article in The Guardian because people are now sensitized to history, to issues around duty to care in ways that uh, usually they're not in intra-pandemic periods. So I've been working on this, doing research for about 20 years. So uh, there is a guidance gap. And what we pointed out in our uh, literature review and synthesis in 2007 was that codes of ethics were largely silent on the extent of the duty to care in an epidemic. The American Medical Association after the 9-11 event uh, did sharpen and uh, focus their guidance to physicians on their obligations in public health emergency. However, I think it's fair to say that uh, the um, 
anxiety that physicians and nurses and other healthcare professionals are feeling about their duty to care is real and needs to be addressed. There are three one... independent considerations sorry. that, sorry, did you want to jump in? Well, I, I was going to jump in with this because I think people can understand the notion of health healthcare workers obviously being concerned about their own health right now. I mean, we've seen some shocking numbers come out of Italy where, for example, I think as many as 75 doctors have given their lives in order to help fight this virus. But what does one say to a doctor who says, I want to help, I want to be there for my patients, I want to get people better, but I didn't sign up to die? Well, then that means that uh, we've kind of failed in our education uh, process because it's always been the case and it still is the case. So, for example, uh, during SARS, the first physician to recognize the seriousness of SARS uh, coronavirus in Vietnam, Dr. Carlo Urbani, who was working for the World Health Organization in Vietnam, alerted the world to SARS and unfortunately he succumbed to SARS himself. Uh, healthcare providers do get exposed to infectious agents. And globally, there are many such uh, um, health systems uh, where they have limited to no access to personal protective equipment. And there are health stations around the world that barely have uh, functioning running water and soap. So when I was thinking about these problems from a global point of view, uh, of course, you, have, you realize that there's differential challenges that we face. So uh, ultimately, because of the guidance gap, and I've uh, checked the Canadian Medical Pro uh, Protection Agents uh, Association's uh, guidance documents, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario's guidance, and um, they are a bit cagey in terms of saying, yes, of course, physicians have a pu uh, positive obligation to care for patients. It's part of their fiduciary uh, responsibilities to their patients that they serve. Uh, they also have special place in society by virtue of their training. There's a social contract and expectation on behalf of the public that we will actually uh, uh, be there to work. And finally, uh, there is an implicit or an explicit, I would say, uh, recognition that you do uh, face ex excess risk uh, and, and you sign up for that when you become a physician. Now, I've noted some people saying we didn't sign up for a suicide mission. Um, but uh, I think the way it is currently in the uh, uh, regulatory and other advice is that you're going to have to make look in the mirror and decide as a physician uh, or as a nurse or as a healthcare professional uh, whether you are willing to provide uh, care in the absence of personal protective equipment. And Let me go to Dr. Gandhi on that if I can. Dr. Gandhi, you've heard about this expression, the guidance gap. What the guidance are you in fact giving the doctors of this province right now? So we're asking our doctors to advocate for themselves so that they have the right equipment. Now, I want to be clear about this. The physicians across Ontario have stepped up to this challenge to the best of their ability and more so. And I couldn't possibly be more proud of our profession right now. In the past five days, 1,300 physicians have signed up for a service that allows uh, hospitals and long-term care homes to, to hire a physician to go into these difficult environments. Uh, our physicians in hospital continue to provide care, some of them working 18-hour shifts. So in terms of putting ourselves at risk and going into these difficult and dangerous environments, <clears throat> I got to tell you, I'm 100% proud of my docs. They're doing a wonderful job of doing that. The only concern is that a reasonable expectation, and I think this is a very reasonable expectation, that if you're going to send someone into harm's way to help society, you need to send them with the proper equipment. And this is particularly the case for a virus that can infect other people. So if there's a young physician who's reasonably healthy, he's likely not going to get a serious complication, but he or she could spread it to someone else in society. And that's where um, we need more guidance as to what that right level is, because we need to protect society as well. So let me make the analogy here and you tell me if this works. In the same way that a construction worker, for example, can come to a construction site and say, this place is unsafe. There's no way you're getting me up in that elevator to go 50 floors up, given the lack of safety that I see, and therefore I'm not going to work. Do you feel doctors are also entitled to have that same view, which is, I'm happy to go try to save lives, but if you don't give me the PPE I need, I'm not going. Yeah, because in fairness, that analogy has some merit, but what, what's not included is the fact that other people are being put at risk, right? By going into an environment like that, so a construction worker can say, well, I need a safety belt if I'm gonna climb up that grid, and that's reasonable. You have to have a safety belt in case you slip. 
the problem is if the construction worker slips, and I hate to use an analogy like this, but if he, if he or she slips, it's only themselves that's going to get hurt. Um, our physicians, uh, they may not get sick because of COVID, but because they don't have the PPEs, they're going to take that virus and they're going to give it to somebody else that they see. And that's the part that as a physician I struggle with because I don't want to harm anyone. Understood. Right? Okay, want- Doris Greenspoon, let me get you in here. Is there is there a situation that you're aware of where a nurse in the province has gone to work, maybe a hospital, maybe a healthcare clinic, who knows, and has found themselves to be in a situation where they thought this is not safe and therefore left and gone home? So uh, let me tell you first a couple of things. In Italy, 75 physicians um, is to come to COVID-19 and 120 nurses already, and two of them committed suicide and committed suicide because um, one left a card, that they, a letter that they would have been with dirty hands either way. Dirty hands if they stay and they didn't have the PPE, dirty hands if they left and they left patients unattended. So the situation is not as simple as having a code of ethics. The situation is, and this is what we have been saying publicly, a duty to care needs to be matched by a duty to protect. And this province was ill prepared to start with. I mean, you can see the press release that we sent jointly with the OMA and RNO, where it was a discovery that tons of equipment of PPEs were actually past the due date. So the duty to care goes with the duty to protect. No doubt, nurses will continue to go to work. Uh, the issue is. Uh, both I have heard from doctors and nurses uh, that uh, doctors have closed offices. That's the perfect example. Uh, and it's very easy to get behind the code of ethics and judge based on that. I want to see anybody that is behind the code of ethics uh, in, in offices like me or you or any of us, quite frankly, or my minister of premier. Uh, to go to the front lines of care and be with people without PPE, doing the procedures that they do without PPE. Uh, people um, are absolutely committed to provide care, but we have the, the imperative, and we still are not doing, Steve, all that we need to ensure they have PPE. I do not believe that we are doing all we can for them to have PPE. Well, what else should we be doing? Well, first of all, we said, and I can send you the letter that I sent um, to the premier, to the premier and the minister about a month ago or more, uh, and then we sent it to the prime minister. We said at the time, let's increase the imports be- before bound before the 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 things get closed up. And now, no, okay, but Doris, we are where we are. We now, that was said, good advice at the time, but we are where we are now. But we didn't do it. But we didn't do it, and we didn't also start the factories here. So let's ramp up those factories. Now, 24 by 7, as health professionals are also 24 by 7 with their patients in across all the sectors. This is not only ICU, it's across all the sectors. Stephen, Steve, uh, people are with cancer are not allowing nurses to go in their homes because they don't have a surgical mask. It's a simple thing. And these are people with cancer. So it's not only about the Patients with COVID is about people with cancer, people with wounds that need the care, but do not allow health professionals but to come in. But would you agree, forgive me, Doris, would you agree that the prime minister and the premier, the health ministers, they say at their briefings, and I want your view on this, they say at their briefings, we're doing everything we can to liberate masks from the United States, from 3M, to retool lines in the province of Ontario so we can make our own. Do you agree with them? Um, I agree with them to a certain extent. I agree with the politicians on that sense. On that sense, uh, I have a feeling that uh, in the civil servant level, those dealing with procurement are still boxed into into more usual case scenario of who you who you deal with, uh, the three levels, etc. I do think that we need to be safe with PP, but we need to fasten the approvals of who can bring PP. I get I get tons of people, as probably many others do, that they are importing and no one is listening to them. I'm not saying let them free to do that, but let's test more and more so we can bring more and more PPE so we are not confronted with people going to work, a nurse, a PSW, a doctor, etc., a respiratory therapist, and not having the proper minimal protection 
in in many sectors and then the N95 and all the rest of the PP necessary to take care of very complex uh, and compromising uh, procedures. Understood. I'm going to read something now that uh, Thomas Kirsch, who's an emergency physician, wrote uh, for the Atlantic magazine. He wrote this uh, last month, and then uh, I'll get everybody to comment on this. Dr. Upshur, I'll get you to go first. He writes, I'm afraid a tipping point could happen with little warning. The loss of providers will come from many causes, quarantine, sickness, caring for their own family, cohorting, but it will be the creeping fear and feeling of abandonment that eats at us the most a slow drip, drip, drip of attrition. Having colleagues sharing the burden is a crucial predictor for clinicians' willingness to work despite the risk. But when the cascade starts, when you are forced to reuse your disposable face mask for the third day in a row, and another nurse doesn't come in because of her concern for her daughter, and you know that two of your colleagues are being treated in the ICU and another 10 are home infected, sooner or later you look around and see so few standing with you. At some point, the system could break, and we will all be gone. Okay, Dr. Ross, let's get some comment on that, if you would. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a very stark reminder that we're in extraordinary times with extraordinary circumstances. So as I hear that, I'm preparing to uh, go back on clinical service. I've worked with the palliative care service here, and we're expecting extraordinary demand. And one of the key principles, I, I like where he talked about this notion of abandonment, but one of the key principles in palliative care is non-abandonment. Someone has to provide care for our patients, and if it means wrapping a bandana and grabbing whatever uh, barrier is in the way to in order to provide the care, I think uh, my colleagues and I who are standing are going to be there to try to provide that care. I do fear about the tipping point, and I'm working with the World Health Organization. I co-chair one of the ethics working groups. And we're hearing signs. This is a global pandemic. What we're experiencing in Canada is happening all around the world. And all health care providers and all health systems are feeling this same sense of anxiety and dread. It's truly dreadful. I totally agree. There is a reciprocal obligation on health systems to provide care, uh, support, protective equipment if possible. There are other ways we can think about organizing and deploying health resources. And my, my big complaint is that the time to figure all this out isn't when the pandemic is you know, burning through populations and healthcare providers. We argued and urged the health system uh, you know, thinkers to take this seriously in the intra-pandemic. Uh, and era. why didn't they it's listen? Not, it's not just duty to care, it's resource allocation. How do you figure out the justification uh, for restrictive measures? There's a suite of ethical issues that we had documented and carefully put out recommendations uh, for consideration. I think we dodged a bullet in H1N1. Everybody thought it was the big one and it wasn't. And so, you know, people like to live lives uh, not thinking about uh, pestilence, death and disease. And uh, so it's hard to sort of focus your attention on these extraordinary possibilities when they're not in front of you. And I just want to remind people that there are other pandemics ahead. We have had seven since 2003 that have had heavy uh, impact on healthcare providers. Let's not forget the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zika, H1N1, and this is our third coronavirus. We need to prepare and we need to start to think about it, uh, you know, if we're not thinking about it now, and Steve, I'm gonna ask you as a member of, uh, uh, of our esteemed uh, uh, press corps uh, to hold our feet to the fire after this is over and come back and say, uh, you know, you had the Walker to, you know, the Walker to crisis, you had three commissions to inquiry after SARS and everything in the Campbell Commission, which was about the impact of uh, SARS on healthcare workers is germane. So uh, let's not have forgetfulness uh, uh, set in once we're out from under this again. Uh, we accept the challenge. Thank you for that, doctor. I want to go to Sohail Gandhi now, Gandhi, excuse me, and, and ask you, now that was Thomas Kirsch, an ER physician in the States, who described a very desperate scenario. And I wonder, in your view, how close you think we, I don't, don't want to be overly dramatic here, but I do want to know your sense of how close you think we are to that scenario in the province of Ontario today. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I am trying not to be dramatic, but I have to tell you I'm extremely concerned about a situation like that. Uh, there are multiple reasons why physicians won't work. They may need to isolate, they may be sick themselves, they, they may simply be at the point of overwork. Um, 
we talk about Italy a lot. And one thing that we've been advocating for at the Ontario Medical Association for, for years is that you look at a country like Italy, Italy has about four doctors for every 1,000 people in their population. And despite that number of four doctors for every 1,000, they were still overwhelmed by this, uh, by COVID-19. You know, their doctor- 1,000 a lot or a little? Canada has 2.4 for every 1,000. Okay. So we are already starting off at over 50% less physicians on a per capita basis than Italy did, and that was a country that was completely overwhelmed. So we're starting off behind the curve to begin with. Some of our physicians will need to isolate to protect other patients. Some of our physicians, unfortunately, are going to get sick. I believe uh, there are 22 healthcare workers right now, as of this morning, who are in uh, intensive care units because of COVID-19. I don't know the breakdown. How many are physicians, nurses, lab technicians, RTs? I don't know that breakdown. So we know some physicians are going to get sick. And I can tell you that it will probably happen very quickly if there's a crisis. Now, that's why at the OMA, we've set up services for physicians to, vo to work extra. We've got a matching service now. And that's why, again, I, I can't tell you how proud of I am of our docs because 1,300 have already signed up for this service to go to different areas and help out if they're needed. Okay, Dr. Gandhi, let me jump in with this follow-up question then. You, you may have seen yesterday the mayor of Brampton, Patrick Brown, held a press conference in which he was surrounded by people who are doctors but who are not permitted to practice medicine here in the province of Ontario because they have their accreditation and credentials uh, from uh, schools outside of this country. Uh, they said they were prepared to work. Um, the Premier has called for all hands on deck. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if the numbers of people homegrown is becoming a problem, uh, should we in fact get all hands on deck and allow those foreign trained doctors and nurses to participate as well? Yeah, so there are many ways that they can participate. Uh, the preference first is we have a number of recently retired physicians who have volunteered to come back into the workforce. So obviously they know the system very well. They know uh, Canadian uh, medical nomenclature very well. So it's important to get them back first. We have a number of residents who are in their fourth or fifth year of training who could get temporary licenses. We need to get them licensed. Uh, certainly a lot of the foreign trained graduates, we welcome any help. They perhaps could be used as something called a physician extender or physician assistant uh, initially to try and help uh, take some of the load off physicians, work under the guidance of an already existing physician. But absolutely, we may be in a situation where we need to use uh, everyone who's willing to help. Okay, Doris Grinspan, let me get you to speak to this. If we get into a circumstance where nurses and doctors and many others are falling ill to this virus, you know this healthcare system as well as anybody. You've been on the job for, for a long time. How, how will this healthcare system of ours respond to a situation where we don't have all hands on deck and, and it's a problem trying to get enough people to come out and treat people. Yeah, so let me tell you what was the major fallout actually in Italy. The major fallout in Italy ended up being that they didn't have nurses for their ICUs, period, end of story. Um, and in uh, Canada, let's not compare to Italy, Ontario is the lowest RN per population in the entire country, and we have been saying it for a long time, and you have heard me tip say that. Uh, if the situation is that uh, health professionals become ill in big numbers, or that they um, uh, are self-isolated for, for reasons of, of COVID, uh, the system simply will crumble. Uh, the good news in nursing is that we already, four weeks ago, launched what's called the via nurse and we do have eight thousand eight zero 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 registered nurses of which a uh, about 900 are critical care nurses ready to go in reserve we started that because of our experience with stars team and as you know i was i was in the position also during sars uh, but the province the province the, the health system in ontario was um, deficient before going in, and it's not just this government, previous and previous. Nursing homes, we have the worst staff nursing home, not just with nurses, nurses, peers, WS, etc., in the entire country. Again, uh, we don't seem to have learned all the lessons of SARS that we could have, not in relationship to PP, not in relationship to uh, the healthcare workers in general, and particularly uh, in nursing. So, I hope we will not get there. I can only tell you we are already sending 
uh, dozens, dozens a day of nursing students, which is in addition to that uh, large number I mentioned of 8,000 because nursing students can serve CSWs. After the first year, so we have sent hundreds of them already to nursing homes. And I know, we had somebody on the program the other night talking about it, and she told us that they're all terrified. They're terrified they that they're terrified. coming right out of the schools and going into the ICUs. It's gotta be scary it's for not them. Not to ICUs, not to ICUs, those are nurses. We will okay. not send nursing students to ICUs. The nursing students are going to nursing homes. And they're equally wow. terrified because they, are, they, they don't have the protection. So, uh, but, uh, Somehow these young people uh, are very, very uh, clear on uh, what they're there for. They mm -hmm. don't many times also have the tremendous responsibility of going back home to a family, right? So right. that allows them a, a different level of leverage. Mm -hmm. But Dora, forgive me, I'm gonna jump in here if I can, because we're, we're down to literally our last minute and I wanna ask uh, Ross Upshur about this. We are seeing pictures on the news. You are hearing anecdotal evidence of it that when there's a shift change at a hospital, people come out to their front porches, they bang pots and pans, they applaud. I mean, we're hearing the Premier of Ontario call people who are doctors and nurses and orderlies our heroes today. Um, do you think that's the right way to describe the people who are working in our healthcare system today? Well, I think it's a uh, uh, comfortable and laudable uh, and appreciated way to describe uh, what uh, healthcare professionals are doing, but we are professionals. Uh, we do have a job to do. And, uh, you know, I like to see what I do as doing my job. That's what I signed up to do and I've been doing for over 30 years. Uh, the support is uh, entirely uh, appreciated and uh, we will do our level best to live up to the expectations and discharge our duties and obligations to the patients uh, the people of, the on of Ontario deserve the best possible care, and they are fortunate to have some of the best health care providers in the world at their service. Amen. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. And obviously, uh, we encourage all of you who are working uh, inside hospitals, uh, inside community health centers, uh, still staffing your doctor's offices with nurses and so on, uh, to be safe, because if you're not safe, the rest of us aren't going to be either. So thanks for joining us, and take care, all. Yes, take good care. I hope you and your family. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.